March 3rd, 2022. Half cast 254, episode 254. Let's go. Of course, I have a few things to share with you guys. An evening of reflection. Shall we? Ex-U.S. Postal Service mail carrier helped carry out killing of workplace rival's husband. <laughs> Jeremy Rules. No wonder nobody can get their mail. These people are out here playing gangsters. Oh, look at this sweetheart here. A face made for the forever stamp. A former U.S. Postal Service mail carrier was convicted of first-degree murder in the shooting of another carrier's husband that stemmed from a long-running feud between two female postal workers. After a three-day trial last week, a jury in Newport News Circuit Court deliberated for less than an hour before finding Tashara Moan Jackson, 31, guilty in the April 2021 slaying of Salahuddin Ibn Sal Shabazz. How can you have a feud with someone when, for the most part, you work alone? What, is she still your mail bucket? <laughs> Shabazz, lone among the group and not working for the Postal Service, was shot and killed just after 2 a.m. April 7th in the front doorway of his Menchville area home. Prosecutors said Jackson wasn't the shooter, but enlisted another Postal Service carrier, Jeremy Todd Petway, 41, to go with her to the Shabazz household early that morning. Hey, if you do this for me, I'll make you a made man, a made mailman. Jackson's conviction follows last year's mistrial in the case against Petway. The slaying prosecutors asserted stemmed from a long-running feud Jackson had with Shabazz's wife, mail carrier Jacqueline Jackie Shabazz. There were several workplace issues between the two women with Jackie Shabazz acknowledging on the stand that she had been having an extramarital relationship with another Postal Service mail carrier whose wife was close friends with Jackson. So let's get this straight. You have a problem with a co-worker that's sleeping with another co-worker's husband. You have nothing to do with it? Yeah, mind your business and keep your job. <laughs> a string of incidents between the two women escalated in March 2021 when Jackson and Jackie Shabazz exchanged words outside a Newport News nail salon. Shabazz admitted to slashing Jackson sires as she was getting her nails done. A few days later, Jackie Shabazz's vehicle was vandalized in her driveway when the family was out of town. Her SUV was spray painted, its tire slashed, and an object stuffed into the gas tank. When the Shabazzes came home, they learned Jackson would attend a party at Harpoon Larry's restaurant on April 6th and went to confront her. Witnesses said Sal Shabazz pointed a taser at others to keep them at bay while his wife and Jackson fought in a parking lot. Jackson would tell police later that Sal Shabazz also kicked her during the altercation. So right off the bat, the fact that I have to work with somebody that I don't know if we're going to get into a fight or not from day to day, that's just stressful, period. Now you're talking about personal property, showing up to personal events outside the work. Now it's spilling over into not only my professional life, but my personal life around my family and everything else. That's a no-no. And let's not forget, all of this is highly unnecessary. <laughs> Following the fight, Jackie Shabazz and the couple's four daughters went to a York County motel for the night. Sal Shabazz, who was intoxicated at the time, decided to stay home. Jackie Shabazz testified she was talking on the phone with her husband when he got a knock on the door about 2 a.m. When he went to answer, she said she heard a brief exchange followed by gunfire. Shabazz was found dead just inside his front door with four cartridge casings found on the floor nearby. So through all this, we still haven't heard anything from the woman who was getting cheated on at last week's trial. Senior Assistant Commonwealth's Attorney Andrea Booten and Assistant Commonwealth's Attorney Jacqueline Donner contended that Jackson had picked up Petway, then drove to the Shabazz's home to retaliate for the restaurant fight. 
Police detective Trevor Buchanan showed the jury an extensive video presentation in which he superimposed cell phone tracking data from Jackson's and Petway's phones onto a satellite map. So somehow she roped an idiot into coming along and doing the dirty work for you to be my girlfriend. If I do this, you're going to be my girlfriend. <laughs> the tracking data showed the two phones came together near Petway's home. Video surveillance from traffic cameras in the area showed what appears to be Jackson's SUV on Jefferson Avenue headed in the direction of Menchville. Buchanan combined that with ring home security footage that shows a shadowy figure leaving the SUV and walking toward the Shabazz's house. The SUV then fled the area with its lights out. Petways and Jackson's cell phones lost network connection at the time with prosecutors saying they turned them off to cover their tracks. In the days following the shooting, Jackson texted Petway that he was there for her. You're my girlfriend now when no one else was and you didn't hesitate when he texted back that he was the protector. Jackson replied they were Bonnie and Clyde forever. Idiots. <laughs> The only mail you're going to be getting from now on is jail mail. <laughs> Petway later texted Jackson that police had searched his house but didn't find his gun. He said he got rid of it by giving it to a female carrier friend. Police later found the handgun under that woman's bed. If I'm working for the postal service, I'm trying to keep my steady job with my good benefits. If I wanted to do street shit, I would have still been in the streets. It was significant, the prosecutor said. That Jackson referred to herself and Petway as Bonnie and Clyde, the infamous criminal couple that committed robberies and killed several police officers and others during the Great Depression. We are criminal actors together. Putin said the reference meant we are doing this together. But Jackson's attorney, Timothy Clancy, said his client was an accessory after the fact, helping Petway get away, but that she wasn't involved in the slaying. That is a bunch of BS because if the girl wouldn't have roped his dumb ass into doing this, he probably would have been home doing something else. He wouldn't even be involved in this. Where's the evidence that my client agreed ahead of time that Petway was going to have a weapon and go out and kill Sal Shabazz? Clancy said he asked the jury, isn't it just as likely they were going out to vandalize the car again? BS bullshit. Though Petway clearly carried out the killing, Clancy said, all Jackson did was help him afterward. That's accessory after the fact. I understand that the defense is trying to plant those little seeds of doubt, but any juror that has any common sense knows that this guy did that for that girl. But the 12-member jury sided with the prosecution. Hey! Play stupid games, win stupid prizes, taking only 50 minutes to find Jackson guilty on the first degree murder and murder conspiracy counts. She faces up to life in prison at her sentencing in June. Whatever happened to just coming to work, doing your hours and going to hell home? Enough to kill a small city. Florida woman caught with enough fentanyl to kill 26,000 people. A Florida woman was arrested Tuesday for trafficking enough fentanyl to kill more than 26,000 people or have a great party for 50 of your closest friends, whichever comes first. According to the Collier County Sheriff's Office, deputies said 53.2 grams of fentanyl was found in 32-year-old Stephanie Tompkins' home after investigators executed a search warrant. Me personally, I look at it like this. How the hell am I going to have 26,000 life sentences worth of drugs in the same place where I rest my head at? In addition to the fentanyl, narcotics detectives reportedly found methamphetamine, 104.2 grams, cocaine, 48.2 grams, marijuana oil, 24.8 grams, Adderall, 18.2 grams, Xanax, 4.7 grams, multiple scales, and narcotic paraphernalia. To put that into perspective, the city of Naples has a year-round population of around 22,000 people. Fentanyl is a powerful opioid that is 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine and 30 to 50 times more potent than heroin. And a dose as small as a quarter of a milligram can be fatal. 
the sheriff's office said in a Facebook post, Tompkins faces multiple felonies, including trafficking fentanyl, trafficking cocaine, trafficking amphetamine, possession of synthetic cannabinoids, and possession of firearm ammunition by a convicted felon. Damn, where the hell she get the gun from? <laughs> wow. Woman accused of pulling gun on driver over pro-vaccine bumper sticker. It's for rubella, measles, and mumps. A New Mexico woman is accused of pulling a gun on another driver on Sunday because she was so enraged by the sight of his pro-vaccine bumper sticker, authorities said. On February 27th, Christina Blair of Albuquerque reportedly became triggered upon seeing the man's bumper sticker, which declared he had been vaccinated against COVID-19 and started honking her car horn cursing at him and even throwing water bottles at the man's car while the two were stopped at a red light. If we're on the road and you're close enough to me to read my bumper sticker, you're too fucking close anyway. <laughs> the 33-year-old eventually followed the man into a Walgreens parking lot after he accidentally backed into her vehicle in an effort to get away from she crazy, man, prompting Blair to pull out a handgun in a threatening way. According to police, the man who was not named said Blair racked the side of the gun, causing him to back away and call 911 in fear that she was going to shoot him. Blair has since been charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. Through the course of my investigation, I was able to determine that in my professional career, Blair is fucking crazy. No, did have an opportunity to leave, but instead overtly reached into her vehicle and retrieved the handgun threatening the man the arresting officer wrote. The victim in the case did capture the whole incident on video. However, footage has yet to be publicly released. Police were able to track Blair down at her home using her license plate, authorities said. Woman arrested for shoplifting sues police after K-9 ripped off her scalp. <laughs> Mika Bates, 24, described to ABC7 News the terrifying moment the K-9, a German shepherd called Marco, sank his teeth into her head during her arrest on February 10th, 2020. I just feel something attacking me, like paws on my back. Then I start feeling rips from the scalp here, here, and here. Teeth grinding. No, I don't know if she did that. She told the news reporter. <laughs> I thought I was going to die. <laughs> I really did. In footage captured on the police officer's body-worn cameras, Bates can reportedly be heard saying, my whole brain is bleeding, before she emerges from a bush where she had hidden to evade police capture. The video shows that the skin on the top of her head has been ripped away with their skull left partially exposed as a result of the attack. Bates was one of the three women arrested for allegedly shoplifting $10,000 worth of cosmetic products from an Ulta beauty supply store earlier that day. So you expect folks to just forget the fact that you had no business stealing from the store in the first place, which is 100% what landed you in this situation. The three women fled the scene with the help of a getaway driver. When police tried to stop the car they were traveling in, Bates and the other two women fled on foot. So now on top of stealing, you're running away from the police. Bates then hid in some bushes where Marco and Brentwood police officer Ryan Resentes found her. According to the complaint filed in Northern California Federal Court by Bates lawyers Dante Pointer and Patrick Buelna, Resentes and the other responding officers at the scene gave their client no prior warning before releasing the canine. I know I'm being critical. I know I sound harsh, but their whole vibe is saying, how dare the police try to stop me for doing something that I know I should not have been doing in the first place. KTVU reports that Bates can be heard on the body cam footage pleading with officers, help me, the dog is biting me, to which one officer replies, we're going to help you, but you shouldn't run from the police. Writing in a police report obtained by ABC7, Resentes indicates that the deployment of the canine was standard for a situation of this kind. It might have been a little overkill. Let's be fair here. Come on. <laughs> the search command was the only command given 
which is standard from my training and experience for an open area search, he states. A police canine warning was not given because I had no indication there were any suspects in the area. Fair enough. Resentez also acknowledges he heard someone shout something like, get the dog off, and that he responded by telling Bates to bring me the dog. When she failed to comply with this request, he said he went over and took Marco off the bike. Based on his review of the body camera footage, he estimates the canine was biting Bates for around 60 seconds, which I'm pretty sure feels like a lifetime. A segment of the complaint published by the New York Post offers up a different version of events, claiming the two police officers at the scene yelled at Bates to stand up, which was an impossible task as leaves and twigs scraped against her open head wounds. Oh, the lawsuit alleges that eventually Bates was helped to her feet and placed in handcuffs before being berated for running from police as if getting her head bit and mauled by a vicious canine was a lawful and appropriate punishment for her crimes. It was extreme. I can't debate that. Not at all. It was extreme. It was overkill. But why are we here? How did we get here? Two years on, she says she continues to suffer with memory loss, nightmares, and depression while her skull has been left badly deformed. I feel ugly, she told KTVU. I get miserable. I get depressed. I'm not happy with myself. I don't even feel cute. Pointer has filed a lawsuit on Bates' behalf against Resentez accusing him of using excessive force and violating her constitutional rights in his capacity as a police officer. It was extreme. I'm not going to bullshit. The city of Brentwood is also named as a defendant in the case. This is an example of the way in which police do not look at black and brown people or criminal suspects as humans, Adante Pointer told the Washington Post. Instead, they are numb to the pain their use of excessive force causes. Resentez and Marco are still employed by the Brentwood Police Department and feature on the city's website, which states the pair are currently patrolling the streets and helping to keep our citizens safe. Fun show. Fun show. Fun show. That being said, I'm going to wrap this one up, but I'll be sure to talk to you guys very, very soon. Adios.